This is the dome of the INT, or Isaac Newton Telescope. The telescope was originally set up at Hurstman Zoo in Sussex, but then moved to the present site in La Palma, where seeing conditions are very much better. The mounting is of the old equatorial type, so that as the telescope is moved either east or west, the changing altitude of the target object looks after itself. Well, where do you look through the INT? The answer is, you don't. The human eye being superseded, initially by the photographic plate, and more lately by its electronic devices such as the CCD. The Lorraine could obtain splendid pictures of objects such as galaxies, look at this one. Sheer visual images are only part of the whole story. Equipment used by the modern astronomer is highly complex. The INT is a good example of an old technology telescope that has been made very competitive again by the use of electronic detectors. And here, Patrick, is a CCD, and this is an electronic detector, and this is what we use to record the light, be it in an imaging mode or through the spectroscope. It has to be cooled down, of course. The CCDs only work well uh, when, they're, when they're cooled to cryogenic temperatures. So this is the cryostat. The CCD lives in this end of the cryostat, and this CCD has 2,000 by 2,000, that's 4,000 light-sensitive areas on it. At the back, you can see where the liquid nitrogen is boiling off very slowly. And then, of course, there's the spectrograph. The spectrograph itself is actually 10 years old, or older, but with the use of these CCDs, it's made very functional. The, the spectrograph splits up the light of a star or a galaxy or whatever using a grating such as this. And if you had a microscope and uh, a good memory, you could count 2,400 lines per millimetre on the face of this grating. And it was instruments such as these that we were using to make the observations last night. In this experiment, we're going to be studying the planetary nebula NGC 6210 um, because we want to, to study the makeup of the nebula to find out what it's made of. We want to see if the, if the star in the middle is a single star or a binary star. And the first piece of data is just coming in now. So let's look at it. And here we see a star in the middle and we see lines that are extended from the star. And this is actually a spectrum of the nebula. And we can isolate those lines and plot a one-dimensional spectrum. Each of these lines corresponds to um, an element. Uh, for instance, this, this uh, system of lines that goes down like that are hydrogen lines, are these strong lines here correspond to argon. And this line at the end here is a helium line. And we can use these lines to derive temperatures and densities for the nebula shell. And from that, by indirect methods, we can then derive the luminosity of the star, the distance to the star, all kinds of things. This technique is the basis of modern astronomy. Many of the older telescopes used with the new devices are far more efficient now than they were when originally set up. But this is a very new telescope, Britain's largest, the WHT, or William Herschel Telescope, named in honor of William Herschel, explorer of the galaxy and discoverer of the planet Uranus. It's a real monster, with a mirror 165 inches in diameter. The major new instrument that's recently been commissioned is a multi-object fiber spectrograph, which allows us to observe 150 objects simultaneously by using a fiber optic pickup. We select which objects we observe by using a robot to position the fiber optic. The William Herschel telescope is probably the most modern in the world. Are there any special features on it that haven't been used before? Well, one of the strengths of the Herschel telescope is that there are a number of different foci. Uh, there's a traditional Cassegrain focal station underneath the telescope, and the light for the Cassegrain focus goes through a hole in the center of the primary mirror but it's also possible to insert a 45 degree uh, split off mirror which can direct the light to either of two Naismith foci, there and there. And that allows us to place particularly heavy instruments either side of the telescope. And at the moment we have a high resolution spectrograph at one side and the adaptive optic system the other side. It's not only the instruments that are new to the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope in the United States. The mirror is the first of a revolutionary design. When you get glass heated up, it becomes, looks like a liquid. So if you can get that liquid spinning, 
just as if you spin a bucket of water around, the surface will take on a parabola shape when it's spun. So all you've got to do is keep the oven spinning, and then as it cools down and solidifies, it'll solidify with a very steep curve um, that you give it in the spinning process. This is a 72-inch mirror, the first to be made by the spin casting technique to come into operation. Is it as good as you expected? It is a prototype mirror, as you say, and it's come through all the tests extremely well, both from the casting process, that it came out very well from the oven, uh, then in the polishing process, that it's come out to be the, the smoothest mirror that is used on ground-based astronomy, um, beautifully s smooth and, and perfect shape. And at the moment, it's performing very well on the mountain. Why was Mount Graham chosen? Mount Graham here in Arizona was chosen because it's in a desert country and so we have wonderful blue skies, at least most of the time. And also because it's on a mountain, it's, it's very high, it's the tallest that's in this region, so we get above the dust and even above some of the water vapor, we get very good uh, conditions and very sharp images. So it's an excellent mountain for astronomy. What are the main studies being carried out with this telescope? There's one project that involves globular clusters to get the magnitude, to get the, as it were, the contents, the stellar contents of globular clusters. And one of the other projects that we've just been doing is monitoring supernova in very distant galaxies, so right out in the universe. Um, so much like uh, this ph photograph, I suppose, uh, at a later stage, the Crab Nebula, but these are much further out in the universe, uh, at very high redshift galaxies, to see what, how their light curves go and so get the distance to these distant galaxies. What about planets? In November 95, um, it had a unique target of opportunity um, on Saturn. That is when Saturn's rings uh, were edge on almost to us, so giving out the least amount of light. That meant that the little moon Titan, which uh, uh, went b nearby the rings and cast a shadow on another moon, Mimas, you're able to see the shadow being cast on Mimas. And so this telescope monitored that event, the, the moon going into the shadow of Titan and then out of the, the, the shadow, all the while moving along the rings. It was a wonderful sight. We've been talking about new equipment on new telescopes. What about new equipment on old telescopes? And here, the classic case is Mount Wilson in California. Here, the largest telescope is the 100-inch Hooker reflector brought into action in 1917. It, it can see out as far to uh, detect very faint objects because it doesn't have the collecting area. Uh, but its uh, location uh, in a site which has terrific seeing uh, gives it a special position and the adaptive optics that we've installed gives it an ability to make sharp images that are superior to those of any other telescope regardless of size. This is an extraordinary technology which was developed by the military, although it was suggested by an astronomer at uh, actually Mount Wilson uh, some 50 years ago. And it works by uh, taking a crooked beam of light, which has been mixed up and uh, blurred by the turbulence of the atmosphere. This crooked beam of light uh, uh, hits a mirror whose surface has the ability to be distorted out of shape in such a way that the crooked beam of light hits the crooked mirror and a straight light beam bounces out. And that can be done 300 times a second. It is really a miracle of technology and it has put Mount Wilson back on the cutting edge of astronomy. Never before has it been possible for students to have access to large telescopes. Now, thanks to modern communications, they can use really major telescopes without even visiting an observatory. Any school can make an, a reservation of time and uh, all they do is reserve, say, one or two hours in a, in a particular night that they want to observe. And when, they're, when their time when their scheduled time comes, then they dial in and uh, link directly to the telescope. And then they take over the operation of both the telescope and the camera. And they see on their screen, on their monitor, the same picture that we have here. And once they have linked to the telescope, they see crosshairs on their monitor. And they, then they can slew, for example, if they wanted to slew up to this particular star, Alia, they can click on that star click on slew to, and then the telescope starts slewing up to that particular object. Right now it's in the process of going there. Now the telescope has arrived on point at that object, and then they can take their image. And they download the image. It takes about three or four minutes to, to uh, 
expose the image and take it down. One great advantage, when it's nighttime here, it's daytime in England, and vice versa. And that is a big advantage, because when it's daytime in England, it would be easy for the students to schedule their time during regular class hours, and it's night here. And it's not just optical telescopes that are using the latest instruments. On Mauna Kea, in Hawaii, the James Clark Maxwell Sub-Millimeter Telescope has had a new instrument installed, called SCUBA. It's the most complicated device, I think, ever put in a ground-based telescope. And the radiation from space comes through this membrane we can see behind. It then reflects off the surface of the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, goes onto the secondary mirror, then goes through the hole in the primary, then goes through various optics, then it goes into SCUBA. Inside SCUBA, there are very tiny detectors, cooled to a very, very low temperature indeed, extremely low temperature, just above absolute zero. These convert the submillimeter radiation into electrical signals, these go into the computer system, and we get a picture. That's what we see. I gather you've used it to obtain the first submillimeter images. Yes, looking at cold dust in space is what SCUBA does better than anything else indeed. And uh, one of the first images we got was of a, of a region in space which have two very hot stars inside of them. And you can see on the image, um, these stars are glowing brightly in the submillimeter. And if you took an image in the radio or the optical or the infrared, you see absolutely nothing. It's only in the submillimeter you see this cold dust shining brightly at us. Um, the second image we can show shows another interesting region, and this is at a wavelength of uh, 0.8 of a millimeter. This is in the submillimeter just. Um, and on the next image, you see the source breaks up into even smaller components, which tends to indicate to us that stars are forming in groups and clusters. And so this is what SCUBA will also do. It will see individual stars forming that we couldn't see before because with our old detectors we couldn't take a picture and we had to just take a single little detector and map it across the sky in a painstaking effort that took all night. And that was a real, real pain. Now we just take a picture and in five minutes, bang, we have an image. That's great. And JCMT has already shown that um, some very powerful galaxies, oh, at redshift of five, which is halfway to the, the, the edge of the universe, or half as old as the universe is, um, these have lots and lots and lots of dust. And the real question is, why do these objects have dust so early in the evolution of the universe, given that the Big Bang was only hydrogen and helium? How do you get the dust from these? So you have to have very intense star formation. And that's something that SCUBA will absolutely really go for. And that's one of the things for the future for us. Some projects, such as the Very Large Telescope, are entirely new. This is Paranal in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile, possibly the most desolate place in the entire surface of the Earth. Until recently, nothing lived here. No insects, not even scorpions. No birds, no animals, nothing. The place was entirely dead. This is no longer quite true because the astronomers have come here. And when astronomers come, other creatures will follow. And why have the astronomers come? Quite simply, here at Paranel had the best seeing conditions anywhere in the world. The European Southern Observatory already has a site further south in Chile at La Silla, and conditions there are excellent. But Paranel is even better. So when a new, vast telescope installation was planned, it was decided to come to Paranel. The VLT is built as a machine. It is built to work as a single unit. It isn't four eight-meter telescopes that are just going to live on a mountain and live their own lives. We are going to run it as an interferometer. We're going to run the telescopes simultaneously on the same target sometimes. We're going to actually archive the results of the VLT and keep them in an extremely sophisticated uh, archive whereby you can actually do research on those results. So, wh for example, when you ask to observe a target, you will be, have the opportunity to see what everybody else has done with the VLT on this target. So the VLT overall is not going to necessarily be a better telescope than the others, although we would like to think so. But it will actually be able to do better science, and that is really what is driving the way we are working with this machine. The ESO already has a very good site further south in Chile at La Silla. Why was Paranel chosen? You're absolutely right. La Silla is a very, very good site, but Paranal is truly the premier astronomical site for optical observing in the world. It has up to 350 nights that we can work in, maybe 320 nights that are photometric. That is, that the sky is so transparent that the light that we get is constant. 
the seeing on Paranal is also exceptional. That's the quality of the images that the site delivers. Even now, during construction, the median seeing that we measure is 0.6 arc seconds. So Paranal, although it is a remote site, it is in the middle of the Atacama Desert, it is very difficult to operate up here, pays off. There are various ways of making a mirror. What about these? Well, we have uh, four meniscus mirrors. That is to say they're very thin mirrors. They're only 17 centimeters in uh, width, in breadth, but they're 8.2 meters across. If you were going to compare them to uh, something that most people would know, it's a piece of paper. You can actually pretty much flap the mirror around. The mirrors themselves will be supported by a, a mirror cell, which is extremely stiff, but then they are attached to the mirror cell through a series of actuators. There's 150 actuators on each mirror, which can actually manipulate its shape and change its shape to compensate for all kinds of effects that would take place, wind loading and other uh, such effects. The unique thing about the VLT is that these four huge telescopes work together as an interferometer. Can you explain just how that works? The VLT is built to operate as a single machine. And in this place, the light gets brought from the four unit telescopes through a maze of tunnels and gets combined in an incoherent way to give us an equivalent aperture of a 16 meter telescope. These are the ports where the light gets diverted to. And here, Patrick, we have the interferometry tunnels. This 136 meter long tunnel allows you to combine the light from the four unit telescopes and the three auxiliary telescopes into a coherent light beam. In here, we have mounted on railway tracks little trains. And on those trains, we mount mirrors. By moving the train backwards and forwards, we can delay the time of arrival of the light, such that all telescopes seem to be operating as a single unit. In this mode, the telescope operates as a 120 meter mirror with an uh, angular resolution of 0.001 arc second, one milli arc second. Uh, when will the Hintar project be completed? Well, uh, the unit telescope that is coming in here with the first mirror is uh, scheduled to have first light on uh, January of 98, and UT2 comes on a year after that, and UT3 a year after that, etc., etc. The interferometry will come online in a basic mode in the year 2000, and then the full operational mode of the entire machine is expected in the year 2005. So activity is in full swing, and all is set fair for the VLT. If it's as good as is hoped, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be, it will be the most powerful astronomical installation in the entire world. And who knows? it might take us right to the edge of the observable universe.